Welcome to Monaco for this weekend's Formula One Grand Prix. It's a race that is truly steeped in history, but before the drivers turn their attention to winning, they first need to get through today's tricky practice session. Monaco provides a close quarters wheel-to-wheel -wheel challenge for the drivers, and even though it lacks overtaking opportunities, it does give us a glimpse of the glamour that can only be provided by a location like Monte Carlo. Monaco is the most prestigious track on the Formula 1 calendar. It's a circuit that's extremely popular amongst the fans around the world, and it's something really special. As a driver, there's nowhere to hide. Lowe's hairpin is the slowest corner of any track on the Formula 1 calendar. It's taken at just 48 kilometers an hour, but provides a stunning view on the first lap as the entire grid bunches up and tiptoes through the corner, hoping not to leave any carbon fiber parts behind. This is such a tight bend that a special steering rack is used just to get around this very corner, as the cars would not normally be able to make the turn. There is the possibility of overtaking through lows, but more often than not, you'll end up damaging your car. Tell that to Adrian Suttle. Hey guys, Harrison and I'm back at it once again with a brand new video for you and welcome to round six of our Sebastian Vettel championship season and this is the one you've probably all been waiting for. Monaco. <laughs> Fun fact, I've not done a Monaco career mode episode for like two years. It's been a while since I've done this and... As a promise to a subscriber of the channel, they can Matt three two one. I believe his name is. I'll, I'll put an annotation in the video if I got it wrong. I apologise in advance if I did. As a tribute to Jules, that I basically leave this video unedited, so you'll you'll get none of the fancy jump cuts you normally get in an episode of this this, this show. Um, disclaimer. Um, normally, I'd say one of these episodes has about um, an hour, an hour ten of raw footage, and I always try to aim for something like half an hour, as, a, as an, oh, my Snapchat goes off in the background, as an ideal video length, so to speak, so, this is going to be about an hour long, um, so get your tea, get your popcorn, this is probably going to be interesting, also, for the record, I'm probably going to qualify. Seeing how this game and how its AI handles itself around here, a clean start from the back is going to be near impossible. And I know it's probably going to be a little bit more boring if I start from the front, but starting from the background here is not going to happen. <laughs> so, as a result of that, I'm going to leave that one there. I'm not going to bother practicing, I'm going to go straight to qualifying on this one. Look at the practice order. What kind of times are we talking here? 17 7 on the primes. 18 1 from Hamilton. Romain Grosjean in third. Ah, we're talking about practice, mind you, so I guess it's not that really a big deal. Alright, qualifying it is. It's qualifying here at the resplendent Monte Carlo Monaco for what is always a special event for both drivers and teams. Qualifying will determine who'll sit on pole at this iconic track. These next few minutes could determine tomorrow's race result as well before it even starts. The driver on pole will be best placed to win the race considering how difficult it is to overtake here. Exactly. To be in with a decent chance of winning here, you need to be on the front row. Even a few places further back on the grid, you've got to rely on a bit of good luck to come your way, as overtaking opportunities are very limited. Guys, I think it's quite hard to pass round here. <laughs> Just a hunch, given what they've talked about in the previews. Okay, so clear forecast. No setups. Uh, let's get out there. I'm flying into this cold, so this is bound to go terribly, terribly wrong. Oh god. Oh god! What the hell? What the hell? Oh 
No, I'm restarting the session, man. That is some bullshit. <laughs> Seriously. What are the odds that on my first flying lap, as soon as they let me go, Raikkonen and spine it in any other end of the wall, and now I'm out in traffic? Oh my god. What is this? What is Raikkonen doing? And of course, I've got Pastor in front of me as well. Delightful. Oh, gosh. That well, that's a good sign. <laughs> oh, dear. This, is, this could be a long race. You know, whenever I go more than like a day not playing this game, I get rusty. And I keep forgetting that the brakes aren't that good in this game. Let's go, let's go. Towards Casino Square. Now I'm going to back off on this lap. Pastor clearly in the way. Sorry, Perez. <sighs> At least it ain't raining. That's the only plus here. Thank Christ it's not raining. should be enough space. 117.9 from Rosberg to start us off. Right, let's go. <laughs> For frick's sake, Dre. I am terrible. Guys, I can only apologise in advance. One for the lack of talking, and two for me not playing very well. Try to juggle live commentary while trying to be fast around Monaco. It's going to be near impossible. But I can only try. Temp for Rosberg through sector one. Lowe's hairpin. Even though I could have swore it used to be called the Grand Hotel hairpin. Bit of front wing in the tunnel. That's always nice to see. <clears throat> Ooh, that's barely legal. That's like watching a bad porno. Okay, that's a banker. It's a pretty bad one, to be honest. Probably because nobody else set a really good lap yet. That's the only reason I'm in P2 at the moment. It's supposed to be 7. I'm joking, 30 miles an hour through the lows happen. Oh god. Didn't realise I was damaged there. Oh, I hate that I got dropped into first gear for a second there.
shit. One more order. Do it. You seem to be losing lots of time in sector two. So close to the wall on that one. Oh god. Now I've caught up I've caught back up to Perez again. Had to be done. <laughs> that on the other hand, probably not. I'm going to hate this track when it's going to be on the more worn out tyres, but that is enough to go fastest. 17-7. <laughs> and I go straight into the wall. Oh, Jesus. Time for repairs, I'm guessing. Well... Let's look at this. Has Rosberg got a reply? Where's Hamilton? You're doing a great job. We're much higher up the field than we expected to be. And why is there no one on track with five minutes to go? This is bizarre. Where is Hamilton? Okay, now we're, go now we're talking, there's 14 guys on track now. Okay, this makes a lot more sense. I was going to say, like, holy crap. NASA is third right now. JB, no way. I think we're on pole, gents. <laughs> yes, we are. Oh my god. He really has pushed himself and the car to the limits today, and he was duly rewarded. It was such a wonderful result. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Marcus Ericsson, Sauber, three and four. Ericsson, third. Nasa, fourth. Felipe Massa, fifth. Jensen Button, sixth. Both McLaren Hondas in the top seven. Bottas, Pastor, Perez. Raikkonen, Hulkenberg, and Hamilton, as well, and Ricardo did not set times. Now I wonder, was it something to do with the crash at the start of the session? I wonder, some kind of glitch. I don't know. Did the, did the damage put him out of the session? I don't know. Bizarre. Did not set a competitive lap. So, just like that, <sighs> Ricardo, Raikkonen, Hulkenberg, and Hamilton are going to be at the back of the field for the race. So, I've got a feeling it might be a two-horse race for the win here. Wow. That's astonishing. That is the most topsy-turvy grid I think I've ever played in an F1 game. It's race day here in Monaco, and a circuit that requires real driver skill as well as concentration. 
Last night, the Monte Carlo streets were full of revelers. Today, they're cleared and ready for racing. It's Sebastian Vettel who's in the driving seat in today's race. He's on pole, and he'll be hoping he can get to the first corner unscathed. Because if he does, he could be on his way to a race win. He want to end this weekend on a high after yesterday's fantastic performance, but he's going to have a lot of competition. I doubt he'll be expecting an easy race, especially considering the teams around him. Nico Rosberg looks to have the upper hand on Lewis Hamilton this weekend. But what can Lewis do today in the Grand Prix to finish ahead of his teammate? Lewis is always confident he can win, but he'll know he's got a tough fight in his hands today. I'm sure he would have looked at the telemetry last night to see where Nico was faster. But if he can manage his tyres better today, I'm sure that will give him a chance of victory. He's starting in 20th place. You'd think that would have been a bigger headline as, a, as opposed to, oh, Nico seems to have been faster than him this weekend. Idiots. Also, I've just kind of come to the startling realisation I'm going to be starting the race on a tyre I did four laps on. Might be forced into a two-stop this race. We'll have to wait and see. Um, they're expecting me in around lap 18. One stop race to the finish. <sighs> well, hopefully the Salbers can provide some great blocking. If they can pinch Rosberg into turn one, we're, we're golden. <laughs> okay, maybe I should have started from the back in hindsight, given the quality names of the guys behind him, like four of the best drivers in the world. Raikkonen, Ricardo, Hulkenberg and Hamilton on the back four spots of the grid. This is a kind of like an open goal ready to win this one, but I am not confident in my driving round here. But, hey, let's see what happens. Let's do it. The Monaco Grand Prix. There we go. That was contact behind me. I heard a bang of some kind. Ericsson holds on to his third place as we got the hill towards Casino Square. Not a good sign. We already skimmed the wall twice on the opening lap. This could be a long, long, long 39 laps. Just want a new advance as well. I will try to use as little flashbacks as possible. Ericsson's still hanging on to that P3 at the moment. Well, that was very wide. But yeah, it's, it's like me and Rosberg have kind of tailed off here at the front. I'm, sort of, sort of trying to, I'm just trying so hard not to hit the wall at Sandovot into turn one. That's by far the easiest place to do it. Ask Felipe Massa, he'll know. Okay, feeling good. Just want to try and settle out into an early rhythm first. If we can get a lead going and then just be a little bit more comfortable, then I'll start talking properly. So easy to clip that inside wall. Gets up to 2.6. That lap was a 17.4. That was better than my pole lap. 
because of course. It's the thing about Monaco. It's challenging, and you never want to pick it in real life. And you never want to pick it to just casually drive around, but there is something of a challenge here. We're getting it right around this place. You can see why it's the jewel in the crown, even though I can't stand it as a track and I wish it would die, but. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. As a kid, this was my favourite track. When I was playing the racing games. When I was playing the racing games to watching it on TV. Like I thought the concept of the walls were cool. Just me you had that thought? I don't know. Probably because I was shit at the F1 games when I was a kid. And because back then there was gravel traps everywhere, beating the gravel was no fun, but you could just bounce off the walls if you turn car damage off, so Monaco was no big deal. Still maintaining a three second lead and nobody can get past the great Ericsson train of 2015. I've made jokes on Twitter before about the Great Wall of Ericsson, given he's a pretty good defensive driver. Oh! Whoa, that's huge! Let me see, that. Let me see what happened here. Whoa! Hang on a minute. Did I actually hit that wall? Let's have a look here. Oh, hang on a minute. That's an invisible wall. It doesn't look like I actually hit a wall on that one. Let's be real. You didn't want me to see this episode end off here now, did you? <laughs> and then again... This game's always... This, ga this franchise has always had an issue with Monaco and getting the invisible walls right. So now it's got to think about getting these tyres to lap 18. Okay, looking good though. Pace is good. Just got to try and dial down the mistakes a little bit and stop running wide into the last corner. I've done it twice this race already and both times it's cost me about a second. Got back up to three and a half. I 
So in other words, if we're clean, we're faster. Oh, minor wall bounce there. Yeah, I'm starting to like, the, the, the feel that there's less grip in the car already. Okay, feeling good, feeling good. Right, back on here. 18.5, that's a bit better. It's an 18.9 last time, I got up to 4.3. Just thinking about the gap, I have to think about a two stopper. I don't want to do that if I can avoid it. This Ferrari is a lovely car to drive, though. Which makes you wonder, wonder who will be my teammate next year. A couple of you asked me to talk about F1 Silly Season in an episode if you wanted me to. And, um, yeah, I thought, why not talk about that? I'm not really mentioning it outside of the podcast, really. But, um, the big one, obviously, is what was, you know, what happens to Raikkonen. If Raikkonen goes... Who replaces him? And I think there's two nailed on contenders, and I think contender number one is Valtteri Bottas. He's been linked with that seat since Bahrain. And contender number two is Nico Hulkenberg. I know many of you are asking, where do I sit on this? And. Whoa. Wow. That's not good. <sighs> see? See? I ease up for one minute and look what happens to me. <laughs> that was a corner cut, my bad. That was a 17-9 though, yeesh. But yeah, Bottas or Hulkenberg for that Ferrari seat. And this is if Ferrari decides to keep him. Let's not forget that. If Ferrari decides to let Raikkonen go, he gets interesting. But if not, they could just keep him. I don't think Williams are going to move one of their drivers on unless Bottas decides to quit the team. I think they'll keep Massa for another year. I don't see any reason to get rid of Felipe Massa at the moment. He's still performing at a solid level. And for all the talk about Bottas going to Ferrari, the last man employed in that Ferrari seat was Felipe Massa. Bottas has a three-point advantage on him after ten rounds. Neither Williams driver has been particularly spectacular this season by any stretch. If anything, it's kind of been a little bit same old, same old from last year, really. Massa, Massa does well enough to keep Bottas honest, and that's a problem. If you're Ferrari, you've got to be thinking. If, if Bottas is only marginally better than the guy we replaced right for Raikkonen, what's the point in hiring Bottas? Massa might be the biggest reason why Bottas may not get that seat in the end. He's really, being real here, he really should be putting him away more often. Like, people said that about, said that about Hulkenberg, and it's like, oh, he's got to put Perez away more often. That's what Martin Brundle said, and I disagreed, because he beat Perez by, 40, by nearly 40 points last year. In the midfield, that's an insane amount of points. It's weird, because their head-to-head -head record on track is actually pretty even, but Hulkenberg tends to put together the more consistent, higher performances. Perez is more of a poacher. He gets the big opportunity, he takes the points. Like we saw in Bahrain last year, he got that podium, Force India's first podium since... Was it Fisher Keller in Spa 2009, I think? Um, but um, yeah, it's a situation where... The problem that Hulkenberg's got is Bottas is the safe bet. And if Valtteri Bottas is the safe bet, 
why would they ever go for Hulkenberg? That's the problem. Hulkenberg carries an element of risk because Hulkenberg has never had a run in a team that's been really good. That's the problem. Last year, Williams was arguably the second best team in the field. Um, maybe not right away, but the second half of the season, Williams looked like they were the closest team to Mercedes. Alongside Red Bull, of course. Bottas had six podiums last year. Was fit, he finished fourth in the championship and was an arguable driver of the year contender. He was excellent. It's high praise when a guy like Eddie Jordan comes out on the record and says, if I start a team again tomorrow, you and Daniel Ricciardo would be the two drivers I'd pick. Big statement from Eddie Jordan. A guy that's been there, done it, and got the t-shirt. Presumably yellow one. Presumably a yellow one. <laughs> but, um... But, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just... I'm just, you know, thinking my head through this in the moment while driving. Oh, happened again. Jesus. Of course, like, the moment I become self-aware, that happens. <laughs> like I said, Bottas has the proof of concept that Nico Hulkenberg doesn't have. Hulkenberg's had a handful of really great performances. The problem is, is that his Sauber car was his Sauber car in 2013 was only really good the second half of the season. Oh god! Touched the wall there. That's not good. I've got to concentrate a little bit more here. I've kind of lost my rhythm. And that bump just kind of jolted my car into seventh gear for a minute there for no good reason. But yeah, I'm saying is that, like I said, Bottas has the proof of concept. You've put you put Bottas in a top level car, he delivers. Last season proved that. Hulkenberg's never had that kind of opportunity, and Hulkenberg kind of carries risk because he's done nothing but drive mid-card, mid-level cars his entire career. He's never even had a chance like Grosjean, where Lotus were really good for half a season, and you know, Grosjean became the guy as opposed to Raikkonen at Lotus. That 2013 season, the second half, Raikkonen kind of gave up. And Grosjean became the guy, and Grosjean delivered. You know, he had three podiums in that spell. Almost won in Japan that season. So, you know. Like, Grosjean is a guy that, for example, has got a bit of proof of concept behind him. Bottas does, obviously. Felipe Massa obviously does. You know, Daniel Ricciardo, who was half hinted with the seat as well at one point. He, he had the proof of concept because, obviously, he won three races last season, and Red Bull were really good. So... All those guys, you know, you put them in a good car, they'll deliver. Hulkenberg's not had that privilege yet. I just got, I just got this bad feeling that Nico will end up being one of these guys that everybody knew was a really, really good driver, but who just was so unlucky to have never been given a chance in a really, really good team. And I feel really bad for Hulkenberg because his resume is ridiculous. I mean. I'm pretty darn sure I'm right in saying he was an A1 GP champion, a GP2 champion, and I think a Formula 3 champion as well, all before he turned 22. He might have had the best resume ever going into an F1 career. And of course, won Le Mans this year too. As if we needed any further proof that Hulkenberg's a really, really great driver. But... F1 doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Ericsson is still third! No one can pass him. Maybe he'll lose out on the pit stops. But yeah, for those guys that have been asking me about that... That's the funny thing. If, like I said, the, the dominoes will start tumbling if if Raikkonen leaves with Ferrari, and if, I think I don't think he'll go anywhere else. I think Raikkonen said in an interview, "It's either Ferrari or I just quit." 
Which is fair enough. I mean, why would you spend time with a midfield team again when you're 36 and probably on the way out? Rakan is the oldest driver in the grid. I think he's 36 in, in, in October. Something like that. So why even bother at that point? Give him the wall on that one. So I still feel okay, mind you. But yeah, like if, if, if there could be a domino effect, because if Raikkonen goes and they get bot ass. There's going to be a Williams seat open. So if you're Williams, what happens then? Now, you could go with Adrian Sutil, your reserve driver. Don't see why I'd do that personally, but that's an option. The option there is also Alex Lynn, who is coming on quite, quite nicely in GP2 at the moment, climbing up the leaderboards. Has had a couple of really good weekends lately. Had his first GP2 pole and his first GP2 win recently, so Lin's chosen a really good time to hit some form. And, you know, Lin is a good driver, and, you know, he's obviously come over from the Red Bull Academy, so you know he's probably quite good at least. And the question is, it's a bit of a gamble given, though, that Williams is a top-flight team. It's not like you're driving for Force India or Sauber, where you can afford to roll the dice like Williams did with Bottas in the first place. Because remember... Williams dropped Bruno Senna for him in 2013. Like, like they were looking for, they were itching to get Bottas in the car, and Bottas looked good when he put him in the car in practice sessions. So, it was a no-brainer. Ditch the guy with a fancy brand name and bring in, you know, another Finn who also looked really good. Kind of a no-brainer, really, in that regard. But yeah, Lin's an option if Williams want to take the gamble on him. Oh, tire on the cliff warning. Great. Now, they, uh, if they don't want to go with Lin just yet, and maybe wait for Massa to retire instead, because Massa is 34, not getting any younger. If they, want to wait for, if they want to wait for his seat to be available instead, you could also go Nico Hulkenberg and say, hey, Nico, want your old job back. Then I think that becomes a matter of whether Hulkenberg wants to come back to a team who dropped him in 2011 for Pastor Maldonado. Not a good look. They dropped one GP2 champion for another. Weird. Remember, Hulkenberg didn't have a full-time drive in 2011. He was a test driver for Force India because Williams moved him on for Pastor. For, I don't, you know, I can think of 27 million reasons why they did that. So... It depends if Falcon would be willing to take his old job back. I think he probably would, in all honesty. I mean, thinking about it, Force India is kind of a dead-end job in that regard. It's like wanting to be a journalist and you work in a Matalan like I do. <laughs> it's like you have a dream, but you know you're never going to reach that dream by working for Matalan. See what I mean? I've got to make these tires last another two laps. I think I can make it. I've got ten seconds to play with too, which kind of helps. Anywho. Yeah, as like I said... Force India is a dead-end job. I don't think anyone's ever left Force India and be better for the sake of it. You, I guess you could argue Sergio Perez after going to McLaren in 2013, but he came from Sauber. But like I said, no one's ever gone from Force India and improved. It's, it's kind of a dead-end job in that regard. That's the, kind, that's the problem with Force India. It's kind of like a poison chalice. So, that could be an issue. So, let's pretend. Let's pretend that Ferrari get Bottas. Let's pretend, then, that Hulkenberg goes to Williams. Then what? Who takes the Force India seat? 
And there's me thinking, possibly Pascal Werlein over in DTM. The youngest driver ever to lead the DTM championship is a solid, is a, is a talented driver. Mercedes have now got two really great talents in their back pocket. And they've got Pascal Werlein um, and Esteban Ocon, who they pinched from Lotus. And Ocon is really good. And remember, he was, I think, wasn't he the champion in FIA Formula 3 that season? You know, like, people, people want to rave about Max Verstappen's talents, but he wasn't even the best rookie in that class that year. People forget that. But, uh, yeah, that, to be fair, that was Max's first season in single-seaters in general, so I guess to still finish third and win multiple rounds is quite the impressive feat, nonetheless. But, uh, yeah, Mercs have got those two guys in their back pocket ready to go. And, obviously, the Mercs team's not going to be available for a good while yet. Maybe not for another couple of years, thinking about it, because... Look at it like this. Rosberg is 30. In fact, I think I'm pretty sure both Hamilton and Rosberg are both 30 years old. Or something very close. I think Rosberg's 29 and Hamilton's 30, something like that. Hamilton's definitely 30, I know that much. So, Mercs are going to think about new drivers, but probably not just yet. Probably not for another three or four years yet. God, that's really wide. Yeah, these tyres are on the cliff now. Really starting to lose their grip. But the thing is, Rosberg's not taking any time out of me. He's in the same boat. In other words, they're about to completely drop off the radar, and now I've got a bat marker to deal with on the way into the pits. Me I almost want Mehi to not slow down. What the hell? Okay, that's three on the fatality count. The dirty air of Mehi's car is really not helping here. It doesn't really matter if I pass him or not because he's a lap down and I'm coming into the pits. Like so. I'm going to assume Rosberg's on the way in. He is indeed. So we've we've got a chance at the Grand Slam here, funnily enough. Because I'm gonna come out of the race in the lead. So yeah, we got a chance at the Grand Slam, which would be fantastic. So yeah, I'm thinking maybe Pascal Werlein for that uh, Force India seat. So for that, or maybe there's the outside chance that Hass F1 signs Hulkenberg. Gene Haas spoke out about it. He said his number one target to drive his car is Hulkenberg. Which I thought, ooh, that's a good one. And yeah, you know, why not Hulkenberg? He, he, said, his, he said he wanted one experienced driver. Hulkenberg would perfectly fit the bill. Um, yeah, he's got, it's done four full seasons. Has not really had any major opportunity in his F1 career. And this could be the golden ticket for a guy like... Hulkenberg. If Haas are, are any good as an F1 team, Haas is willing to lose a hundred million a year to keep the team afloat. He's a billionaire. He can afford to do that. This might be the big bucks chance that Hulkenberg would be waiting for. So, you know. I think it's certainly one that's worth thinking about if you're Nico. I said, Force India are going nowhere. Haas might be something. I know I'm kind of playing the Alonso argument here because Alonso, you know, Alonso, I think, kind of cottoned on and realized that he was never going to win anything with Ferrari. Whoa. Clip the, clip the wall on Mirabeau. In case you didn't even notice, I'm sweating real hard right now.
But uh, yeah, like you know, I think I think it's going to be someone in that team alongside Alexander Rossi. I think Rossi is the young American, makes perfect sense. He's second in the GP2 championship right now, and Rossi's been excellent this year. So you know, have the young, have the young gun Rossi, who is a very good driver, um, makes perfect sense for a team like that. And then you know, you got Haas are in partnership with, F with with Ferrari, and you know Ferrari have got two solid drivers sitting there with no jobs really at the moment. And that's John Eric Verne and Esteban Gutierrez. Now, I think Verne is a better driver than Esteban. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> to be fair, I'm surprised I went 20 laps before doing that. <laughs> I'm on brand new tires and all. Terrible of me, as you cross the halfway point. But, um, yeah. I mean, Vern would be, again, another ideal guy for that kind of team. And, you know, maybe Rossi is a third driver. That could make sense. Run Rossi in a few practice sessions to get his feet wet. And, you know, have Vern and Hulkenberg... Wouldn't that be like the most overlooked F1 team ever? Because Hulkenberg is like the perennial guy that never gets the top seat, and Vern was very unlucky to have missed out on a Red Bull seat, not once, but twice. The first time round when Weber retired, and the second time round when Vettel left the team. Both times he was overlooked for somebody else. First time round by Daniel Ricciardo, who scored one point more than Verd did. <laughs> um during their time together at Toro Rosso, I think it was 30 to 29, and then one gets a seat in one of the best teams in F1, the other one was out of a job. F1 is a game of cruel and very small margins. But, uh, yeah, Vern, another perennially underlooked guy, and I think, like, because Red Bull had the logic of, hey, why do we need two Ricardos? Boom. See, if I was bothering to edit this, this is the part where I put in another You Know Nothing Jon Snow reference. But, um... Hey, it turned out to be quite alright in the end, given the fact that Kvyat's outraced Ricardo for, like, four of the last five rounds, so... It looks like Dr. Marco's decision to promote Kvyat over Vern was probably a wise one. They, they gave Kvyat the nod over Verne because of his potential. Nobody really bought it at first when Kvyat looked very mediocre. But as time's gone on, Kvyat's got his head down, gotten on with it, and he's looked really good. So, you know, sometimes it, it, sometimes it pays just to keep your head down and just, you know, let your driving do the talking. And, you know, Kvyat's done a, a fantastic job at that. It's like, Damon Hill summed it up best. When you give a spectacular guy like Ricardo an unspectacular car, it just sucks all the impetus out of him. Like, Hungry was like the first signs of the 2014 Ricardo coming out to play, which was nice to see. And I applaud him for having a go at, you know, trying to beat Rosberg for second on the softer tyres. He was practicing that dive bomb move a lot. I talked about this in the last episode as well, but, you know... Like, Ricardo's stock's going down by the race at the moment, and it's not a good look. Like, even a great result, like a third-place finish, was completely taken away by the fact that Kvyat was second. The best result ever by a f Russian driver in Formula 1. Take that, Vitaly Petrov. But, um, yeah... I don't think anything's happened in that Red Bull department for the time being. If anything... <laughs> Jesus. Come on, Dre, get it together. Sorry, Stevens, had to be done. Oh, God, that was another hit on the wall.
There we go. But are there any other driver change rumors I'm thinking about here? Probably not because Sauber's already confirmed their team for next year. They've already confirmed that Sauber and so yeah, Felipe Nazar and Marcus Ericsson are sticking around for next year. So you know that puts them in good stead. I mean, I, I don't see it. I mean, I'm surprised they locked their driver lineup down this early, like before the summer break. That's rare. You don't normally read into things like that normally, but you don't normally see a team confirm its 2016 lineup before even the halfway point of the current season. But hey, both of those guys are well funded. I think both of them have performed reasonably well. Oh, for God's sake. Forgive me, folks, really. I mean, this is this is difficult. Whoa. Like, this is more difficult than people, I think, give credit for. I know a lot of people just do this live so they can fully concentrate and then edit it and then post-commentate it afterwards, like Ara, for example. My style isn't as, you know, captivating or is not as well edited, but I'd like to think the commentary adds a little bit something different instead. <laughs> I'm losing... I'm losing count now. This is ridiculous. Right, there we go. Ah, oh, the comments are going to be so delightful when this comes out tomorrow. It's like this was this wasn't anywhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's just been far worse. Still got 15 laps to go. But still driving, you know, fast at least, I suppose. Yeah, I don't think there's, if there's any other driver city season talk going around. I don't think Merck's are going to replace anybody. I don't think Toroso is going to... Like, Lotus is an interesting one because Lotus, there's still a lot of talk that Renault might buy them out. And a Renault have a factory team again in 2016. That's interesting. And... Was it... Oh, wait. If, 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 if Lotus get... If Lotus get bought out by Renault, would they replace any of the drivers? And my response was, probably not. Like, is Pastel still getting funded by the Venezuelan government? Because if he is, I don't see any reason why Renault would let go. But then again, they're a factory team. Also, I find it a bit bizarre that Renault are pulling out of their own Formula series. They're, you know, they're dropping the Renault part of Formula Renault 3.5. Because it's going to be just Formula 3.5. I think they're keeping the name for the 2.0 series, which is just bizarre. Don't know how that really works, but whatever. Okay, Already about to lap Hulkenberg, who for some reason is in a field of his own in there. I wonder where Hamilton is in relation to all this. Because I know Hamilton was at the back. Blue flags, Nico, out of the way. Nico, slow the F down. Where is he going? There, oh God. Hulkenberg, what are you, what are you doing?
There we go. A rare moment where Hulkenberg drives like a fucking clot. Just blocking the racing line completely. Piss off. But yeah, Lotus. If I, I don't know if Pastel's still getting funded by Venezuela, because I know when Chavez was no longer in charge, I heard that all payments to Venezuelan racing drivers were suspended. I don't know if that was ever resolved or not. Because Pastor is one of the best funded drivers in the whole field. And Williams will be getting a good chunk of money from it, so who knows. If not, who do they go with to replace him? And I'm thinking maybe Pierre Gasly if they want an all-French team from GP2. Renault's got a couple of guys in their back pocket. Again, possibility that somebody loans a driver out as well. Monaco has high-speed corners. Where? That's news to me. I'm also thinking about what happens to McLaren's reserves. That's an awkward situation given they have Stoffel Van Dorn. And Kevin Magnussen waiting in the wings. Like Magnussen, he's too busy retweeting his own fans, telling him he deserves to be in F1, really, to. Yeah, it's a really, in my opinion, be driving F1 is clearly far too preoccupied wallowing his, in his own self-pity. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't really Kevin's fault he lost his job. It was just Fernando Alonso was available. When Alonso's available, you answer that phone call. Poor fella. Madison wasn't all that bad. It was just, you know, what were, what were people expecting him to do against Jensen Button? A world champion still probably looked at as one of the best drivers in the field. Oh god, look at this sodding traffic. There's like eight cars up ahead. This is gonna suck balls. And I still remember in an interview the other day that Ron Dennis said for the first time he'd consider loaning Stoffel out to a team and, and McLaren paying a team to employ Stoffel. Just to, just, just to get his beak wet while the McLaren tries to find a way to make their team better using their experienced combo of Alonso and Button. Ah, there's Hamilton. P16. So he's got past Raikkonen somewhere, but he's now struggling with this new traffic jam to get through. We've got 10 laps to go here. Now, how are we going to pass all these dudes? Let's just say, thank God it's not IndyCar. There's two of them taken care of. Hamilton and Raikkonen gone. Next up, we got Grosjean back there. Who would loan Stoffel though if the opportunity came up? Because obviously Sauber would. They've already confirmed their lineup. What? What happened here? What happened here? It looks like I've got him into this corner here. 
Grozon's come across the apex of the bend and he's just taking me out, really. Oh god, that's not much better. <sighs> For freak's sake. My bad. Jesus Christ, Rogro. Oh my god, Rogro! <laughs> He wasn't letting that one go, was he? Are you unaware of how blue flags work, Grosjean? That's right, eat a dick. <laughs> you know what they say, eye for an eye and all that. How are you supposed to overtake bat markers at Monaco? Fucking seriously. The AI is completely stupid when it comes to blue flags. Looks like Raikkonen may have overtaken Hamilton, which is also good news. In ego buffing news of the day. Button kind of slowing down, but not really. <laughs> oh my god. What is that? Button tried to slow down. He's hit... He's hit the left-hand wall. I've been shut... He's... He's, he's shoved... He's just shoved me there. What is that? I, I, in, 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 in this game by Codemasters, the AI has it in themselves to drive over the apex. <laughs> Jesus. No, that was, that was a bad place to take a flashback. Welp. I think the piece of the front wing is stuck under my... I got a puncher. I got a puncher. No! Oh, this is my worst nightmare. Okay, if I'm honest, one I cut, I probably deserve that, given all the traffic that was around. So I'm probably going to lose the lead on this pit stop. Where's Rosberg at? Solid. Oh, obvious corner cut. And I've got a sodding puncher! Was all going so well. Here comes Rosberg now. Well, he gave me a good shove for his troubles and all. Yeah, that's right. You ain't getting past me without a fight, bruh. Fuck you, Rosberg. What move? He drove into me. Oh no, and Rosberg's coming. <laughs> wow. Rosberg had to come in because he drove into me and broke his front wing. Lol. Oh no, he's come out ahead. Oh, you son of a bitch. It is so on. 
Well, where's Ericsson in relation to the both of us? Well, this has now turned into a very intriguing seven lap shootout. Both of us on the option tires, but Rosberg's going very slow. Tries to dive into the lowest hairpin. As tight as I can turn it. Oh, and Rosberg spun. You know what? Don't even care. Do not even care. It's Monaco. All's fair in love and war. Rosberg can suck my plum to drive it into me. That was fair game. And now I'm on a fresh pair of options. I still have the lead, and now I can blast it to the finish. Huh. Rosberg was given a time penalty, and rightly so. That's poetic justice right there, that is. Come on, Dre, let's do this. Oh, there's Rosberg in the pits, again. Ericsson's now, Ericsson's now in second. Jesus. God, keep it together, Dre. It's in the bag now. Look, I could stop again now and still lead the race. I've really got to stop being so aggressive here. Completely needless otherwise. Was Rosberg got into another collision somewhere, I wonder? Good, so are we looking at a double Sauber podium here? The first double Sauber podium since Canada 2008. <laughs> That was Robert Kubitz's and Nick Heinfeld's 1-2. Kubitz's one and only race victory, I believe. <laughs> Guys, I can only apologize. I'm not driving well. I'm hot. I'm bothered. It's ten past one in the morning. Just let me bring this thing home so I can get this over with. This has been a manic Grand Prix. This has been the most Monaco of Monaco races. I just want to finish it now. I don't even know why I'm sweating so much. Probably, cause, probably just because of concentration. It's not even that warm tonight. 
London can, London can get quite sticky and quite fumid very quickly. Oh god, another bat marker. Oh god, it's Stevens again. Amazingly, all 20 cars are still running here. That's a good boy, Stevens. Three laps to go. <sighs> For the love of God, don't make me ever have to do this again. We're already at an hour twelve. I guess I would kind of get in a taste to see what come, what my real qualifying pace would have been like. Oh, for goodness sake! <laughs> Tried so hard not to swear like a sailor right now. Don't even care. There's a huge traffic jam on the other side of the track and I have no idea why. Normally at this point I'd probably stop to check out what's going on, but I can't be asked. I seriously just want to finish. Hopefully in the next two and a half minutes we'll do that. I've inadvertently kind of put on an, an impromptu clinic even though I've used about 15 flashbacks. Has anybody got a flashback count going on? That'd be pretty handy. Just saying. Two to go. And I could probably go for another 12 laps in terms of fuel if I really wanted to. That's the scariest part about all this. I've not even raced at anything near my full maximum potential speed. But I don't care. At least there's no way in hell I'll fail the FIA fuel sample test at the end. Isn't that right, Daniel Ricardo? Uh... Should we do a Sebastian and see if we can set the false slap on the final lap? Why not? Legitimately trying quite hard here, even though I really have no reason to. None. I honestly think Rosberg took our Grand Slam at the end, but I don't care. Oh, we won! We won! We won the Monaco Grand Prix!
and I'm exhausted. I am down in this glass of Vimto. I'm drinking it like it's a bottle of whiskey at the moment. Holy shit. He's really performed brilliantly today. Yes, definitely. It was a brilliant race, and one that you can tell the fans really enjoyed. Well, what a weekend that has been. Please join us next time for another thrilling instalment of this Formula One season. You know what it is? I think Rosberg's overtaking me in the pit lane stopped my Grand Slam. I'm a bit pissed off about that now. <laughs> Shit. Well, here's the result. Vettel wins by 54 seconds. Don't ask me how. Marcus Ericsson second. So Ericsson got second in the end. Bottas third. So the Williams got past Felipe Nasa in the end, but still a superb fifth place for Nasa. Pastor Maldonado in sixth place for Lotus ahead of Fernando Alonso in seventh. Then we have Daniel Kvyat in eighth. Sergio Perez ninth. Lewis Hamilton got himself a point. Clawed his way up into 10th place. That's well earned from Hamilton. Ricardo 11th. Carlos Sainz in 12th. Then Max Verstappen. Raikkonen 14th. Rosberg finished in 15th, including a 5-second time penalty. So, like, yeah. Hamilton, sorry, Rosberg would have finished 4th if it wasn't for the time penalty. The time penalty cost Rosberg 11 places. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. Jensen Button, 16th. Romain Grosje on the lap down. Stevens, Hulkenberg, and Mehi makes up the rest of the field. So, Drivers' Championship as it stands. We lead the title race by 58 points over Lewis Hamilton now. Bottas up to third ahead of Raikkonen with 71 points. Raikkonen with 64. Then Ricardo with 52. Massa's up into sixth place with 44. Rosberg's wretched season continues in seventh. Felipe Nasser up into 8th now with 22 points ahead of Kvyat. Ericsson now has 18 points in 10th place now as well. Then ahead of Button um, and Grosjean, Maldonado, Verstappen, Alonso, Sainz, Perez, Hulkenberg, and then the two Manners. The Constructors title, Ferrari's lead now stands at 84 points ahead of Mercedes. Williams in 3rd with 9, 115 points. Red Bull up to 71 Sauber now in a clear fifth place with 40 points after that second and fifth. A superb result for Sauber. Lotus in sixth place, then McLaren with 17 points. Toro Rosso with nine. Force India with five. And Manor, of course, still yet to score. Well, I hope you thoroughly enjoyed these 78 minutes of mayhem, madness, and goodness knows what else as Rosberg almost hits the wall on turn one, the poor sod. But, um, yeah, I hope you very much enjoyed the race. Um, I'm never doing this again, and now I'm going to bathe in a, in a bath of my own sweat. Until next time, I've been Harrison101. Thank you so much for watching. Hammer the crap out of the like button for this, and I'll catch you guys next time. Sayonara.